Hey, 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 Truth Be Told listeners, coming into your timeline with another bonus episode, this time with one of my all-time favorite comedians, Kevin Fredericks, aka Kev on Stage. I've also heard him pronounce it Keeve on stage. We're going to ask him what that's all about. Well, Kevin is a force. And why I love him so much is that for me, he is the embodiment of what it means to forge your own path. Over the last 12 years, he has built an online audience of more than 3 million followers. He's done two sold out national comedy tours. He runs a merchandising company, a production studio. He has three of his own podcasts. And did you see him host the most recent verses with BB and CC Winans? Well, I got a chance to catch up with Kev recently, and here's a little bit of our conversation. Kev, we met like a decade ago at a Jack and Jill event I was emceeing in Seattle. You were the comedian, I was the host, and look where you are now. Do you remember that event? Yes. That's when I found out about what Jack and Jill was. Yes. I came from a different side of town than what Jack and Jill <laughs> events were on. <laughs> but it's been a long way since then. And I want my kids to be in Jack and Jill. I need to find my local chapter. It was so fancy. We had, oh, a, I, I'm going to post a picture. I have a picture of you. And so it's like me in like a ball gown and you in a tux. Like we were doing the thing a decade ago. I would love <laughs> to see that. It's been a long time. Love to see that. You know, Kev, I'm curious. You started uh, doing stand up in high school at a church talent show. When did you realize that you were funny? I realized I was funny a long time before that. When I could convince my grandma and my mom to let me stay up later (laughs) by making them laugh, that's when I realized I was funny. Because usually we were, you know, this is grown folks business. Go to bed. You shouldn't be around here. Once it was like, Kevin, do that, do that shout that Sister Daniels did. Show show them that shout. Once it was that, you know, it only bought me five or ten minutes, but five or ten minutes when you're like seven is is a win. So that's when I first realized that being funny could get me things that I that I desperately wanted. Okay. Also you have to tell me where does Keeve on stage come from? Did somebody call you that? Keeve on a, a comedian kept mispronouncing my name as Keeve on. And it be, just became an inside joke after that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're almost like an OG when it comes to comedians who who have maintained this really strong presence and, and following on social media. But your rise in the scheme of things really happened so fast. You and your wife, Melissa, had these good jobs at Boeing. And anyone who's from the Pacific Northwest knows, like, to work at Boeing, that is it. Like, you can have a wonderful right. life in Seattle <laughs> at Boeing. <laughs> I tell people, like, that was like getting a job at the chocolate factory. Like, it was like Willy Wonka. You get there, you don't you don't quit. You you stay until you die or they lay you off. But you do not quit if you work for Boeing. And uh right. strangely enough, we both quit and 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 only up from there. Not immediately up, but eventually up. Right. You made this choice with two kids. This move to Los Angeles and to do comedy, what was the moment when you said, having these really good jobs, the thing we're going to do is to quit Boeing and make this our main thing? I can tell you exactly the moment, interestingly enough. And it's a very interesting thing. My son had a video go viral, a couple of videos go viral. And he was reached out to by agents in Hollywood to play Buckwheat in a Little Rascals remake. So I took some time away from work and took him out of school for a little while. And we came down to L.A. to shoot the Little Rascals Save the Day. And we were on set one day and it was a break. They were like changing the camera positions. They were turning around, moving lights over and things like that. And the sound man who operated the boom pole, he was on a break and he just sat his boom pole down next to his rig and he was just on his phone texting. And at that moment, I was like, wow, this is this guy's job. Like, he's just taking a 10-minute break the same way I do at Boeing or from just going down to grab a soda. It's no different than any other job. He just gets to make movies for a living. And that was the moment where I was like, I don't I don't have to be the star of the movie. I don't have to be filthy rich. I just want this to be my job. And I want my, my 10, 15-minute breaks to be on the sets of movies or... Hmm. 
something like that. And it was that simple kind of mundane thing. I called my wife right after I saw that. And I was like, we have to move. When you called Melissa, your wife, and, and made this declaration, was she immediately on board? Uh, I wouldn't say she was immediately on board, but I wouldn't say she was immediately not on board. I think she was, she probably had some suspicions that I would get to this point uh, during this trip. And I remember all she said was, okay, let's develop a plan, which was probably the best answer possible because it both, you know, it got me interested still and it didn't kind of like kill my desire to do this, you know? And, you know, I worked on a plan with her, submitted a plan to her. We kind of tweaked it together and came up with something that we can agree on. I think that I might have sent that to her in October of 2012. And by March 2013, we were living in L.A. How has it been navigating your faith in this city of Los Angeles? Have you had folks ask you to be something that you're not? You know, a a friend of mine said when I moved here, and I I took this statement to heart, he said, as you rise in this city, this city will give you whatever you, whatever your desires are. If your desires are women, you'll get women. If it's drugs, if it's partying, if it's alcohol, whatever your vice is, you will get it in excess. So make sure you know what you want. And I think for me, I've always been focused on maintaining my family. And that's the excess thing that I want. My excess isn't a Coke filled party in the hills. It's taking my kids to Japan. You know what I'm saying? Mm. So uh, luckily I found churches that were were led by creative Christians. So they understand how to navigate this industry. They work in this industry as well. And that probably was the most integral part of navigating this landscape. Because I think pastors back home, and this isn't a dig at them, it's just not their arena. It's harder to understand how to pastor people who live and work in this industry if you haven't pastored Mm -hmm. people who live and work in this industry. Or you're not living and working in this industry. So when your pastors, you went on tour with Brandy or worked for Death Row or worked for Kanye or Diddy, or you see those people coming to church, it's easier to navigate when they have some experience being in that in that industry. So that was important as well. This is so powerful what your friend said to you, essentially like what you feed will grow. I think there is this conception that Los Angeles is just another sin city. Like you have to navigate not falling into those coke filled parties in the hills. But what you're saying is like, it's all about what you focus your attention on. Absolutely. And for me, what I have always done, another piece of good advice I got from a deacon in Washington. This one I was doing stand up just in Washington. He was like, now, boy, you're going to go far. But listen, when you go out of town, you get off that airplane, you go to your hotel, you go down to the venue, you do your show. You know, he he pronounced venue like vineyard. You go down to the vineyard, oh, it. you do your show, <laughs> okay? When you finish down the vineyard, you go back to your hotel, you go back to the airport. You make them three stops, and you won't get in trouble. Now, you tell, start making four and five stops, now you're going to get in trouble. And I took that to heart as well. Like, for the most part, at home and especially on the road, when I leave my house, I go do what I'm supposed to do, and then I come back home. And when you go do what you're supposed to do and come back home, then your chances of stumbling or being led to stumble are much lower. As many times as possible, I go with my wife to places, you know what I mean? But I'm not looking for that stuff. And even if it is around, I think the way I carry myself, people just don't ask me like, hey, you want to bump? Like nobody's ever asked me (laughs) for that. So, and I don't tend to be around parties where that's happening. And I don't, you know, I just don't carry myself like that. And I just... If, if I was even around, I, I don't spend too, mi- too much time in those type of spaces, you know. Right. It's just like you don't, you don't know what, you, what will happen if you routinely do those things, hang out with people you don't know, routinely drink or party or be at events till two or three in the morning. You don't know what you're capable of. So I don't allow mm-hmm. myself the opportunity to continually be in those circumstances. So that, so the decision's not as hard because, and then I got a reputation for Kevin going to do that. He's just going home. 
So I didn't even right, get invited right. to things, which makes it a lot easier. Now, sometimes I felt yeah. left out, but for the most part, I'm good with it. Like, don't invite me. I'm going home anyway. I'll see y'all at work tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you carry yourself a certain way, but you have also evolved. I mean, I've been following you pretty closely throughout your career. And one thing yeah. that I noticed is from time to time, you've gotten some pushback from from maybe disappointed fans who who measure your, I don't know, for lack of a better word, Christianess in a way. Yeah. You talk about real stuff like sex and, and, you know, other life issues. How do you manage that push and pull? So that's a great question. Here's the truth of the matter. I'm almost 40 years old, right? Uh, very few of us who are 40 or near 40 are the same person we were when we were 25, you know, True. or 30. So a lot of people have been tracking me. My oldest went first went viral when he was five. He's now 11. You know, a lot of us have changed tremendously in 11 years. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Especially 30 to, you know, 40. Um, I think I have evolved in the way I think about some things, as we all do. But to answer your question, I had to let go of holding what strangers thought I should be close to what I thought I should be. I spent a lot of time trying to make sure strangers were happy with me. But then I realized it was it was like a cage because there's millions of people. And the same thing that makes you laugh offends someone else. The same person is happy that I'm growing and changing. Another person wants me to stay exactly the same. And it was it was it was too constricting to try to live up to what million. I literally have millions of fans, millions of people think. So, and I listen, I, I disappoint myself all the time. So you aren't special if you're not disappointed in me. I tell my spouse I'm supposed to eat right and work out five, six times a week and not drink sodas and sugary drinks. And after we finish this podcast, I'm going to Starbucks and getting a shabar acai with lemonade. Right. So if I can disappoint <laughs> myself or my wife or my kids, you are not special enough to not get disappointed by me. You make sure that you act in a way that you should be proud of yourself. And I know whether you are happy with me or frustrated with me or disappointed, I will be acting in the way that I see fit at all times. And if you go, that's fine. Hopefully the, a person comes that is in line with me at this time. And I'm OK with people coming and going. Like, think about your favorite artists. You don't necessarily like every phase that they're in musically. That's true. Every movie mm -hmm. they make, you may not like every choice they make. You may stop liking them overall. You might like their first three albums and hate four through nine, but does that mean they shouldn't be allowed to make what they want to make or do what they want to do or take their career how they see fit? And sometimes we don't like stuff for a while and then they come back and they're great again. So I think every artist should be allowed to take their own journey and let the people who are enjoying that part enjoy and let those who don't, don't. And I think that's how I've been living for the last couple of years. Once I kind of freed myself from trying to appease and impress everybody. It, is there a project in the works in the future where you peel back the layers even further and we get to meet the people who made you? Because, I mean, it's pretty obvious that you're grounded in a really strong family. But also, are they funny, too? Yeah, my my wife is funny. My my kids are funny. My mom, my grandma. I would love to do a project, um, you know, based off that. Usually when I'm developing things, it's pieces of their character, not necessarily an actual representation of their character, because I don't want, you know, I, I, I just would rather be fictionalized. But I would love an opportunity to show kind of like how I got here, because <laughs> it was the it was the result of a lot of funny people, not just me coming up with all this funny stuff in a vacuum, for sure. When you and Melissa first got married, first off, like, I don't know why it's seared in my head, but I think it was your prom or homecoming picture. Like, <laughs> I see you guys as that. Why Melissa still look the same? My wife, for the most part, looks exactly like she did when I met her. You know, just a little wiser now. So, you know, but me, you know, I'm a little heavier. My hair's in a different position. Uh, but no, I think she's just, I've been I've been blessed. She's been blessed to look amazing since the day I met her until the, the moment I just saw her a couple of minutes ago. But I'm curious, what did success look like for you then when you all were early, an early couple just getting married and planning your lives out together? Uh, you know, 
here's the interesting thing. I've kind of always felt successful and it wasn't it wasn't money. I think, you know, for us, I remember when I first had my first real job at Bank of America, success was being able to take her to Jamaica on a cruise. And all that was was affording a ticket to Miami for her and I. And I think the cruise was like 350 bucks. And we had like an interior stateroom in the worst part of the ship. But you couldn't tell us we weren't living our life. Because when the ship stopped, mm-hmm. we were in Jamaica. We got all you can eat food. Like at that time, we couldn't do nothing that wasn't already included. We ate the food that was free, drank the drinks that were free. You know, the soda and the, and the I mean, not even the soda. At that time, only the lemonade was free. And that's what we drank. And we j- enjoyed that as much as we went when we went to St. Lucia, you know, last year. You know, uh, I found that when you appreciate everything, you're not upset wherever you are. You know, when our kids were young. We took them to the zoo and the park because that's all we could afford. Maybe to a Mariners game because people would go around selling those little ticket booklets and you could right. get a game to a, somebody they'd be playing that no one cared about, you know? Uh, so we went to those games and we had hot dog money and we took pictures and we had a great time. And I think we've, we've found a way to enjoy life at every step of the way and appreciate every part of our life. And just as we've had more success, those destinations have changed. But the love and camaraderie is the same as when we took our kids to the park and had a picnic or took them to a Mariners game. We got a free booklet or buy one ticket, get three free type of thing. We've always had fun wherever we were. You can't beat those park dinners, though, especially in L.A. It's just it's perfect. (laughs) Perfect. You know, something I'm curious about. Have you ever done a video and then decided like, nah, this this ain't it? (laughs) What what is your process for deciding what makes the cut? You know, Lately, I mean, there, there's a lot of things that I know someone can make fun of, but not me. It's not part of my, you know, everything I laugh at isn't something that I make fun of. You know, I think mm. that's what group chats are for. That's what your real life friends are for. Some things are just not meant to be talked about publicly. So that's part of it. Uh, and I've even deleted some videos. If I post something and the re- response is so negative that I'm like, You know, or where I got it wrong. Like, you know, sometimes the information I had was incorrect and people in the comments say, Like what? Give us an example of something. Uh, For instance, I was making fun of these. I thought they were adults, but this guy had basically taken a girl on a cheap date. And I was just making fun of how cheap the date was. Someone in the comments was like, Kev, these people are like 15 and 16. They announced it. They didn't look 15 and 16. They looked 23, 24. And I was like, well, if they're 15 and 16, then that's probably all the money they have. It's not... It's not a fair joke if they're, you know, Mm -hmm. if they're high schoolers. So that's just, that was a couple years ago, you know, but for the most part, I usually think a little harder before I post so that I don't have to delete them. One thing about creatives that we know, we've seen it over the decades with comedians, um, is this autonomy and this ability to be able to take ownership over your craft, which is why Mm -hmm. when I saw that you were starting your own production studio I was like okay okay Kev is doing the thing like you really are serious about this when did it become apparent that you needed to build the thing you wanted to see in the form of creating your own production studio I'd love to tell you I had this great epiphany and the the clouds move and the sun appeared but it was really much more practical than that we were working together with a a company called Transit Pictures and they were producing Keep Your Distance and a lot of the sketches and then like podcasts and things for, you know, Tony and Tahir. And we were shooting out of their space a lot. And their space was small, so small that they had to tear down and rebuild whatever set they were going to use. So there was a podcast. They had to clear out everything, build up the podcast studio, light it and do all that. Take that down for later in the day to shoot a sketch then rebuild it for the next day. And we thought, man, if we had enough space that we could at least keep the podcast studio up and we could, we could be more efficient by having more space. So, so we said, let's look at a bigger space so that we can shoot podcasts and do all this and that and not have to tear down and build every time we wanted to shoot something. And it was really no, no more of an idea than that. And we're like, we get this big enough, then we could rent it out when we're not, shooting there and help it, you know, cover some of its own costs. And that was the genesis for Kevin State Studios. And then we could also save on location fees. 
not have to worry about going and building a green screen, all these things that we had to do all the time. And that's where it came from. Back to your Boeing days, living in Washington State, and then making this leap to move to Los Angeles. What does success look like for you now? I mean, you've got so many things going on. And yet, I mean, from my view, it actually feels like it's just the beginning. Yeah, from my view, too, I think for me, success is simple and complex. The simple part is I just want to be able to make what I want when I want and create opportunities for other people. And Mm -hmm. I think no matter how big I get, I think I will always reserve the right to create in a way where I don't have to get notes from someone. It might not be on all the projects, but I will always have either a passion project or a platform where I can say what I want. And I think as I rise and hopefully accumulate more resources, I think I always want to share those resources with people. I think one thing I'm noticed, known for is sharing my platform. You know, keep your distance. I'm putting on six, seven comedians a night, once a month, always giving opportunities with the stuff that I work on. I always try to cast up and comers or people who are not gotten an opportunity to play at the level that we can offer. And I think my hope is that as I continue to grow, I just will have more resources to give those opportunities to other people. And that to me is success. It's not about having all all the money in the world or being able to do whatever. It's about being able to do nothing if you want to do nothing, being able to create whatever you want if that's what you want to do, and being able to create opportunities for other people. And by thinking of success like that, I'm always able to be thankful in the moment because wherever I am in my career, I should be able to be doing at least that. Even if I don't, if I lose the followers and the money, I can always just repost another creative's funny video and I'll still be creating opportunities for other people. Man, you know, this show is taking on what Black liberation looks like. I mean, the ways essentially we can be free in every aspect of our lives. I'm hearing that from mm-hmm. you. I mean, it's freedom is forging your own path while still maintaining these core parts of yourself as a Christian and a father and a husband. I mean, you sort of answered this, but what does Black liberation look like for you moving forward, like as an individual? Very simple. No notes. I think in Hollywood, you always have to take notes from someone else. You can't cast who you want to cast without the director's approval, if you're not directing, or the studio's approval, or the network's approval. You can't make this show the certain way without if somebody's paying you without that person who's paid you's approval. What Kevin on stage studios has offered me is the ability. If I want to make whatever I want, cast whoever I want and have the show go whichever way I want with no notes. And I think that to me is liberation Mm -hmm. is I don't have to answer to someone on a joke, a, a costume or character or casting especially about something that they might not even know about. I remember when I was pitching the show that I'm working on, a white dude told me that nobody black would get this show. And I'm like, one, you're a white (laughs) middle-aged man. Mm -hmm. You're not the intended audience. And how are you going to tell me, a black person, that black people won't get something that I'm telling you was my life? And I remember I was pitching Mm -hmm. the show to someone else, and they were like, well, you got to have the characters do that. I'm like... Black church people would never do that in a church. No matter what you you could murder somebody, you still wouldn't do what he was suggesting in a church because we have we just have these characters have reverence for that, but they, he didn't understand. And that's when I realized this show's not for somebody else to be able to give me notes. Kevin Fredericks, aka Kev on stage, comedian, studio founder, host, social media star. And soon to be author, his new book with his wife, Melissa, titled Marriage Be Hard, comes out September 13th. And you know we have to have you back on to talk about that. Me and my hubby have a lot to talk about with you on that. (laughs) Would love to. Kev, thank you for taking the time. Of course. Thank you so much. Love to do it again.